first speaker is Dr. Hannah Fan. Dr. Fan is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Clinical Pharmacy at the College of Pharmacy and faculty affiliate for the Susan B. Meister Child Health Evaluation and Research Center at the University of Michigan. Dr. Fan practices as a clinical pharmacist specialist in pediatric pulmonary medicine with a focus in CF at CS Mott Children's Hospital in Michigan. Dr. Fan's current research interests include patient caregiver, education and medication adherence, medication use in schools, and interprofessional care of children with chronic illness, such as cystic fibrosis and asthma. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Fan, who will present partnership in CF care communication and collaboration when considering complementary therapies. Welcome, Dr. Fan. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the conference committee for inviting me today. Um, so today I'll be talking about complementary therapies. Um, and so what do I mean by that? Um, of course, I have no uh, no conflicts of interest related to this presentation. So we'll talk about the current landscape of complementary therapies um, and current chronic disease management, specifically in CF, and evaluate the current available data on a few, a few products that are out there um, that are commonly used or reported to be used um, in CF communities, and the reasons for use, the possible effects, and then clinical considerations um, if using it in, com in combination with uh, traditional medicine. And then we'll talk about uh, recommended practices and co-production of care when it comes to communication and the potential use of supplements uh, marketed to promote lung health um, in people with CF. So what do I mean when I talk about complementary therapies? We also know them as Complementary alternative therapies, or CAM, which I'll be referring to for the rest of the presentation is CAM, uh, herbal products, alternative medicine, alternative or herbal supplements. So the term complementary is uh, more so in line with a non-mainstream approach that is used together with conventional medicine, whereas alternative is formally defined as when it is a non-mainstream approach that is used in place of conventional medicine. Integrative health, as defined by the uh, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, or NCCAH, uh, brings together conventional and complementary approaches together in a coordinated fashion. And functional medicine um, is similar to integrative health, um, but also refers to an approach resembling uh, naturopathy. So when we're talking about integrative health, it emphasizes multimodal interventions. So there's only uh, there's not just one way of approach to, to treatment. So that's a combination of use of conventional therapy that could be medication, physical rehab therapy or psychotherapy or a combination thereof, plus complementary. And that could be things such as, for example, acupuncture, yoga, probiotics, dietary supplements. And um, integrative health emphasizes treating the whole person versus an organ system or condition specifically. And it is a coordinated care that is uh, interprofessional in nature with different providers, possibly different institutions, um, and bringing together again that conventional and complementary together to care for the whole person. And so when we're talking about complementary health, what do we refer to that? So it could be nutritional, um, which are defined as including probiotics, uh, dietary supplements, herbal supplements, food as medicine, um, dietary patterns, psychological, which we can see here in red, that could be mindfulness and spiritual practices, psychotherapy, meditation, et cetera. And then physical, which are in the blue on this chart, uh, which can include manual therapies, heat cold therapy, acupuncture. And there's some overlap, as you can see in this figure, in terms of complementary approaches, overlap between uh, nutritional and psychological, as well as psychological and physical. For this session, uh, given that we have a limited time, we're gonna be talking about nutritional supplements. And as you can see here from a report from the NCCIH, here are the top 10 most comp common complementary health approaches from 2012, which is actually the most recent reported on the website. There's nothing newer than this, unfortunately, but um, you'll see at the very top here, natural products. And then below it, you'll see various physical um, and psychological complementary therapies as well. But today we'll be focusing on natural products um, otherwise, we'll be referring to the rest of the presentation as CAM. So uh, a group of my uh, colleagues, my residents um, and, and um, at the University of Arizona in spring of 2019 decided to disseminate a survey amongst the CF community, and that included the CF Foundation Community Voice, as well as the Stick Life social media site. And we asked a series of questions about complementary alternative medicine, or CAM, one of which was, have you ever considered using it or have you used it in the last 12 months? And as you can see here, 
a good portion of adults with CF, over 50%, report that they had used CAM in some form or fashion in the last 12 months, and that um, about a quarter have actually not used it yet, but actually considered it. And this survey was amongst, um, again, adults with CF and caregivers of persons with CF of all age ranges. Um, our total sample size for this particular survey was over 1,000 individuals who responded to the survey. So the different types of CAM that were reported from that survey um, and the no total number N here are the people who actually responded to specific questions. Um, so you can see here the most common being probiotics but that the next few are um, including natural or herbal plant supplements, which we'll talk about a few of those today, vitamins and minerals, as well as essential oils. There are some folks who are using homeopathic agents as well as combination products to promote lung health. And we'll talk about what does that mean. There are various CAMs that are seen or used um, amongst the CF community. And these are just a small fraction of those that are reported um, as well as inquired about at CF centers. And those can include different um, properties in which uh, the particular product may, may provide, including effects on anti-infective properties, having anti-inflammatory or lung health properties, um, effects on the GI tract the jet gastrointestinal tract, including the liver, and then behavioral health, um, including depression and anxiety. There are also products out on the market that um, are labeled or state that they promote immune health or liver health, digestive health, lung health, or lung function. And we'll talk about why it's worded in this fashion versus treating a particular condition. But um, we'll talk about a few of these products in more detail in terms of the data that's available, and then best practices in terms of how to approach integrating uh, complementary therapies if they're elected to be used. So just as a reminder of the FDA approval process, we'll go through the FDA approval process and compare it to what uh, supplements on the market undergo in terms of surveillance. So as a reminder, there is a several step process when it comes to uh, compounds, when it goes from discovery of a compound to final FDA approval. When a drug is first developed, the sponsor develops a new drug compound and then tests on animals and then submits an uh, um, investigational new drug application or IND. And then it goes into clinical trials if it goes further with phase one trials with about 20 to 80 patients on average, then moving on to a phase two in the hundreds of patients who may actually have um, a, the particular condition and then phase three, which is a higher sample of patients. after which all of those phases are completed, then you go into review by the FDA uh, through a specific panel. A new drug application is reviewed in detail, and that can include um, review of the data that has been collected, the studies that have been completed, as well as inspection of the, comp of the site in which medications will be made, et cetera. And then a review of drug labeling in which what is the drug being labeled for in terms of indication to make sure that it's appropriate and that it is um, appropriately being communicated to both healthcare professionals and consumers, meaning patients. Uh, the facility inspection also takes place. And then finally, drug approval. So this does take quite a bit of time, quite a bit of resources to get it from a drug compound of discovery to safety and efficacy trials from animal to phase one in smaller samples, larger samples in patients who have the condition, and then finally reaching market. Um, and then following marketing and being out there in the world, there are phase four studies, which are the post-marketing studies, looking at any sort of adverse events that have popped up since then, and then follow up um, after drug approval and use. So again, a very lengthy process with a lot of resources and data behind it. When we think about supplements, you may look at the label of a particular supplement. And it'll often say promotes X, Y, Z. So promoting lung health or promoting healthy lung function. But to keep in mind that this is not equivalent to what is labeled on a FDA approved medication or drug that says treating, diagnosing, preventing, or curing any particular condition. So the terminology is very distinct for a reason. The FDA requires that dietary supplements use terminology such as promotes, and they cannot use terminology such as treating, curing, or diagnosing, et cetera, because that implies that it is a drug and not a supplement. When we're thinking about health supplements, they're considered under the umbrella of foods, actually, under the FDA. And companies can introduce a dietary supplement to market without notifying or getting approval from FDA. They do have to abide by certain laws and rules, um, but the FDA does not formally approve dietary supplements for safety and effectiveness, nor do they routinely analyze the content of the supplements that are out there. 
Dietary um, supplement companies are responsible for ensuring that their products meet safety standards uh, for diet for their products and then that they are not otherwise violating any laws. They can't be marketed for, again, for the purpose of treating, diagnosing, preventing, or curing a disease, but they can promote a certain health aspect. And all supplements are required to have a nutrition label in the form of a supplement's facts label, as you can see here on the right. It looks pretty similar to what our nutritional supplement or nutritional, excuse me, labels are when you look at the back of a food product um, in which it would state how much uh, the daily value, a percent of daily value, as well as the amount in micrograms or milligrams. Um, but again, to emphasize that it is not always routinely analyzed by the FDA to make sure that this is abiding to that. The FDA does have limited resources. And so they do review product labels and websites um, when they can to make sure that there are no false claims out there um, and that they're not, that companies are not um, rendering their products as drugs, rather as supplements. And they do monitor adverse event reports, and we'll talk about how to file an adverse event report uh, about uh, regarding dietary supplements. Um, so they'll monitor those reports that are submitted by the companies themselves, by healthcare professionals, and by consumers. And they'll periodically inspect uh, facilities if there's a red flag that pops up that needs further investigation. And they do take action if things are found unsafe or violating laws, but nothing is brought routinely in terms of screening, and it only comes to that action should enough evidence come forward regarding adverse event reporting, et cetera. So it's given that there are limited resources um, across the board, the FDA um, has kind of prioritized their approach in terms of supplements given the limited resources. And that includes priority one being public health emergencies or products that have caused actual injury or illness. And then um, depending on what it remains in terms of resource availability, focusing on um, investigating products that are adulterated, fraudulent, or otherwise, otherwise violating laws, but not quite causing harm yet. And then uh, if remaining resources are available, then to look at analyzing product samples um, during inspections of items or those that are pulled from market. So again, not as much bandwidth and resources and as much of um, magnifying glass when looking at supplements. There is some regulation to some degree, some oversight, but very limited. Um, so just to keep that in mind as we are talking about supplements and things that are gaps that we can identify in the future to improve upon as a community. So this is the table that we had before in terms of the CAMs that um, are commonly seen. Again, not an all-inclusive list. Those that are in yellow are ones that we're going to actually go over a little more in detail in terms of the data available today. So we'll be going over Manuka honey, elderberry, colloidal silver, um, cannabis and cannabinoid products or CBD products, um, turmeric, uh, slippery elm, um, and then we'll just touch upon some combination products and how to best approach looking at combination products in terms of label and data. So for Manuka honey, um, a lot of us may have seen this in health food stores. I actually saw it in my local Costco not too long ago. Um, it is a honey that has been further investigated not only in CF, but other chronic conditions. It is often taken orally if it is used at all, but there have been some proposals that folks may use it as a sinus irrigation, and we'll talk about why there's one particular study that looked at that. Um, possible adverse effects from uh, Manuka honey consumption, generally it's pretty well tolerated. Um, there may be some GI side effects in terms of stomach upset, um, diarrhea, even constipation. There may be a burning sensation when it's irrigated in the sinuses. Um, and uh, some possible drug interaction considerations. There are some data out there to suggest that maybe the consumption of Manuka honey can decrease the serum blood levels of drugs that are metabolized by cytochrome uh, 3A4, which is important because modul CFTR modulators such as Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor, Tricapta are um, metabolized by 3A4. So the first uh, evidence of data that I decided to put into this presentation. Now, this is not all inclusive. These are just the more recent studies that I have identified. But in 2019, there was an ex vivo study, a CF model study looking at the anti-pseudomonal activity of Manuka honey and antibiotics. So either alone or in combination with common antibiotics that we use for pseudomonas treatment in CF. That includes ciprofloxacin, ciftazidine, and tobramycin. They were tested alone, either as the honey itself or the antibiotic itself or in combination. And they looked at incidents of resistance patterns um, and isolates that may be susceptible to Manuka honey. Manuka honey did inhibit many isolates that were found in this study, 
um, and where abnormally high concentrations could not in terms of the antibiotic, and that the combination of the two increased potentially antimicrobial activity. Again, um, a study that is not in, it's a bench study, so it's not in human study trials yet or anything like that. But recently in 2021, Lee and colleagues decided to do a prospective single-blinded uh, randomized parallel to arm pilot trial of Manuka honey in a solution that was a 10% solution versus normal saline as a sinus irrigation for CF associated chronic rhinosinusitis. This was a study of 13 individuals, adults with CF, who had previously had sinus surgery. Um, and they had specific criteria in terms of the uh, duration of which they had their surgery, if they had purulent drainage. They were excluded if they were under 18. This was, again, only adults. If they had primary immune deficiency and also excluded if they had a previous a sinus tumor or severe or emergent complications from chronic uh, rhinosinusitis. Um, and so the, they had their patients go 30 days with either the 10% solution of the Manuka honey or saline, and that was irrigation uh, through the sinuses twice a day. Primary outcomes were to look at recruitment and retention and their treatment tolerability and secondary uh, outcomes included the effectiveness, which were measured by the SNOT-22 score, um, endoscopic evaluation and cultures. Generally, they found that the irrigations were relatively well tolerated. Uh, the retention rates of their 13 that were enrolled were high, but um, again, it's a very small sample size. Preliminary data showed that it achieved a clinically important difference in terms of quality of life um, and a better endoscopic outcome. But uh, of course, the investigators really encouraged that further studies needed to be done to be able to draw further conclusions and really have more of a universal um, recommendation for the population. All right, and so at this time, the, the role of Manuka honey in CF, um, again, probably future studies are definitely needed um, where there is not a pinpoint delineated role, um, but something to consider and to consider the data in terms of what's available out there. Um, elderberry. So um, elderberry often is available in products like gummies, tablets, chewables, um, and so oral consumption. Um, and uh, for the highlight here for the avoid the honey from nectar rhododendrons that actually was supposed to be on my Manuka honey slide, I apologize for the typo. But to go back to Manuka honey real quick, if someone were to purchase Manuka honey, it's important to look at the source in which you're getting your, um, your product from. There are some lower price products out in the market that may come from nectar from rhododendrons. And rhododendrons are actually naturally toxic to humans um, and can cause neurological uh, toxicity. So take a look and make sure that if you're using Manuka honey, that it's not coming from rhododendron flowers. Um, and so flipping back to elderberry, um, elderberries are orally consumed um, in terms of gummy form, chewable tablets, et cetera, capsules. Um, they may have some GI side effects in terms of constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain. Um, it is related to grass pollen. So if a person is allergic to grass pollen, they will have a, 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 an allergic reaction to elderberry as well. So they may have rhinitis and shortness of breath. So be careful of, of looking out for that if a person has allergy to grass pollen. Um, and then it can also cause... Um, dizziness, numbness, or stupor if the, bell, the berry itself is consumed and it's raw and unripe. But most of the time, a lot of folks won't consume actual fruit, but the products that are made from elderberry. In 2020, McKinnon and colleagues decided to do a double-blinded randomized placebo-controlled trial of elderberry uh, extract, as you can see here. And it was a certain volume uh, given twice a day for five days. And it was used for outpatient treatment of influenza in the emergency department. It was not a CF-specific study, but um, a lot of folks think of elderberry as kind of like an antiviral supplement, and thus this study was relevant for this. The study included 87 individuals, five years and older, um, but of note, the average age of the participant was about 20 some years of age, so a lot more adults than younger children. Um, and participants had to have less than 48 hours of which they had two moderate severity symptoms and they had to have a positive test for influenza. They found that there were no difference between the groups in terms of time to reach to no or mild symptoms or resolution of symptoms. Um, however, the investigators felt that the results contradict previous studies, which then prompted uh, the question of should there be, there should be future studies of elderberry to kind of really delineate and clarify what's, uh, what is truly the, the trend. Um, 
And in 2021, Whelan and colleagues um, did a systematic review of available data. And that included five randomized control trials, which did not include this 2020 study, unfortunately, um, regarding elderberry for treatment or prevention of viral respiratory illness. Again, not CF specific, but general use for um, antiviral sort of and respiratory illness prevention. They found that there were varying dosing and dosage forms so it came in either chewables, capsules, liquids, extracts, um, and found that overall based on their review that elderberry may reduce severity and duration of colds, but the evidence is still uncertain. Again, kind of opening that door for additional future research. And that may, may reduce the duration of influenza, but again, evidence being uncertain. Um, and that compared to also Tamivir, which is otherwise known as Tamiflu, um, uh, that we use an antiviral uh, uh, conventional medicine for influenza, uh, it may have lower risk of complication adverse events. Um, does this data point towards elderberry as a universal thing for antiviral? Not necessarily, but it's something in which, um, you know, if a parent or family were to ask about it, to be aware of the available data out there that is not necessarily CF specific, but there is some um, viral data out there regarding use in influenza, as we saw in the McKinnon study, as well as this uh, systematic review. Um, of note, elderberry may interfere with immune suppressant therapy, so to keep in mind of that if um, it is being considered for patients who have undergone transplant. Okay, colloidal silver. Um, this is a product that is thought to have antibacterial properties. Um, there are available routes, uh, products on the market to be used orally, like drops on the tongue. Um, some families have actually also reported using it nasally as a spray, kind of like aerosolized as well. Um, of note, the products that are out there, um, it has been recommended that the amount of silver, colloidal silver, should not exceed 14 micrograms per kilogram per day. And that a lot of supplements that may be on the market based on the recommended dosing may actually exceed it. So there is some um, consideration in terms of looking at maybe silver levels in the serum and things like that for safety uh, reasons as well, if you were to, if your family, patient and family decided to, to use this in combination with conventional therapy. Um, there is an irreversible blue skin coloration um, with colloidal silver. So some kids and adults may have a bluish tone to their skin. There is the risk of neurological deficits, um, and there has been known reported deposition in visceral organs as well. As far as drug interactions, there really isn't known data. Does it mean that there isn't a drug interaction? It just hasn't been reported or studied well yet. In 2020, um, Dominguez and colleagues did an in vitro study of colloidal silver, looking at multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacteria, including pseudomonas and gram-positive bacteria, uh, such as staph. And they were looking at um, the minimum inhibition concentrations for these um, and found that they found a defined minimum MIC. However, it is not known whether it translates to a specific dose or route for actual treatment. Um, so it really can't be translated from petri dish to person quite yet based on this data. Um, but given the risk of toxicities, investigators re recommended additional research needed to of course examine that safety and dose and um, things like pharmacokinetics, how it's processed in the body. Um, a question about uh, dep deposition in visceral organs, actual deposits of silver in like the liver, the kidneys, different organs throughout the body. And that's what that meant. In 2021, um, Feisty et al, their group looked at an in vitro study of colloidal silver, again, looking at pseudomonas, and MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, um, and looked at various concentrations. Um, the purpose was to kind of just look and see if it's a possible future treatment for chronic sinusitis. Um, it suggested that it has that potential, but again, didn't have good defining of what a proper dose would be, a safe dose would be, how it should be administered. So again, leaving a lot of open-ended questions in that respect. There was an old case report in the literature in 2008 of, of, um, in Southampton uh, where an 11 year old had been um, using colloidal silver uh, as complementary therapy as part of their CF care. Um, and this is a particular patient case report in which their lung function decline had gone down to 24% um, and had grown bacteria such as um, uh, Burkholderia multiborans and Stenotrophus multophilia. 
Um, they used the colloidal silver twice a day and reported a blue skin color reaction, which was the reason for the case report. Um, the providers in this case report did monitor silver levels in the blood. So that was a monitoring parameter that if colloidal silver was elected to be used, um, that would be a monitoring parameter to consider. There are publications out there and data suggesting that, again, um, the caution, like a, a cautionary tale of products out there that may be dangerous in terms of the amounts of concentrations and the sources. Particularly, there was a publication by the folks in Finland in 2021 talking about colloidal silver products that had been um, adulterated and or um, inappropriate in terms of concentration and amount. So just to be cautious, again, FDA does not oversee everything and isn't um, micromanaging companies for products like this. So um, just making sure that we're careful about what we're using and how we're using them. Okay, um, so let's talk about turmeric or curcumin, which is found in turmeric. Um, the most often route in which it's consumed is by mouth. So you'll see a lot of powders, ta um, tablets out there on the market uh, for use. And um, it can have some effects in terms of the body, including GI side effects, um, uh, slowing of blood clotting in some cases. Um, it can, has been suggested to contribute to iron deficiency anemia because it can chelate iron. Um, and it can be associated with liver damage in some individuals at high enough doses. There are possible drug interactions with turmeric or curcumin, um, including effects on cytochrome P450s such as 3A4, it can increase the levels of those particular drugs that undergo that metabolism, one of which a class of drugs that are very important for our, our patients um, with CF is CF2 modulators. So a lot of them are 3A4 substrates. Um, and so making sure that keeping in mind with that, if uh, turmeric is being reported to be used. Um, it also can interact with antiplatelet medications in terms of blood clotting and causing worsening risk, increasing risk for bleed can interact with diabetic medications and transplant medications. In 2004, um, there was a study reported by Egan and colleagues. It was an animal study of curcumin with uh, mice that have Delta F508 at various doses. Um, and it appeared to correct the nasal potential difference defect in those particular mice. And so because of this data that kind of spurred the future studies and investigation of curcumin and turmeric, um, and uh, as a possible treatment to correct defects in those who have homozygous expression of F508, but the dose amount wasn't clearly defined. In 2021, um, Telebi and group described um, a pending prospective double-blind control trial. And this would include patients ages five to 18, and they would be treated with a nano curcumin um, formulation up to 30 milligrams at bedtime for three months. And their primary outcome is to look at inflammation based on serum biomarkers such as interleukin, so things in the, in the blood that um, indicate inflammation, IL-6, IL-10, um, and things as well as neutrophil count. And secondary outcomes would include lung function um, and quality of life. This is a study that hasn't been executed yet, or at least not described the results in the literature yet, but this uh, particular uh, paper was describing their protocol in general. Um, and so this is a protocol that is pending or undergoing execution um, in Iran at this time. So again, the role of turmeric or curcumin in CF probably needs further delineation and further study. As you'll see with a lot of these products, we there are potential effects. There's things out there that we're seeing on cell culture data or on bench research, but we really need to investigate it further on an animal and a human level to really further understand it. Slippery elm is another one that has been brought up occasionally. Um, it is consumed usually orally as a tablet form um, or capsule form from what I've seen. It can cause contact dermatitis. It is allergic. Um, it is related to the elm family tree, tree found family. So if you are allergic to elm trees, you're likely allergic to slippery elm. Um, there is the concern out there that it can slow the absorption and reduce the serum level drugs of oral drugs. So if taking slippery elm and you're taking other medications, it might decrease the amount that gets to the bloodstream or slows the action of those medications. In 2020, um, there was a publication of a 16 week single arm pre post study. Now this wasn't a study of just looking at slippery elm, nor was it a population purely in CF. 
Um, this was a study that was looking at slippery elm as part of a combination drug product or not drug product, supplement product um, that included curcumin, aloe vera, slippery elm, pectin, peppermint oil, and glutamine. Um, and this particular supplement was aimed towards GI disturbances. Um, and so they enlisted adult participants with a total of end of 43 patients who had moderate GI disturbances and that included reflux, heartburn, uh, nausea, bloating, abdominal pain, chronic constipation, or diarrhea, um, and uh, including those who were had inflammatory bowel disease. But when looking closer at this paper, patients with CF were excluded from study. So that's unfortunate. Um, and they looked at questionnaire scores as their outcome. That includes the Leeds Dyspepsia questionnaire, GERD-Q questionnaire, et cetera. Um, and they found that reports of improvements in symptoms were reported overall, um, looking at this particular supplement, combination supplement, but again, excluded patients with CF. So really hard to tell if it has, you know, if this particular product has a role in CF and the concern with the combination with drug interactions, it would be advised to be used very cautiously if used at all. Um, so as far as drug interactions, um, we need to take a look at ingredients in specific when it comes to a combination product. So there are combination products out there that um, are labeled promotes lung health, promotes liver health, promotes digestive health. And when you look at the supplement facts, there may be a list of all these ingredients. Um, and so it's important as clinicians that we take a moment, look at each ingredient and think about what is the purpose of this ingredient in this combination product? What therapeutic effects does it contribute? Um, so looking at this second column in this table, for example, and then think about what are the potential effects of that particular ingredient um, in terms of any GI effects, overall organ system effects, et cetera. Um, and then if that ingredient has any theoretical or proposed interaction and what sort of mechanism does it go under in terms of its own metabolism? Does it go through the liver? Does it go through the kidneys in terms of process? Does it interact with the cytochrome P450 system and which ones in particular? Does it include 3A4? Particularly for me as a pharmacist, I'm very concerned about certain cytochrome P450s. When it comes to CFTR modulators, I always keep a very mindful eye out to look for anything that may interact through 3A4, since 3A4 is where our modulators come into play. And so I don't want to disrupt the efficacy or safety of our modulators when we're using them. And then what is the, the, the weight of the evidence behind that particular ingredient? Is it cell culture, like sort of data? Is it animal data? Is it human trials? Did it go through phase one and phase two trials? How far along in terms of drug development trials did it get to? So um, this was a looking at a combination product of various ingredients. And as you can see here on the far column on the right, a lot of the data on individual ingredients are very limited. So that includes stopping at maybe phase one human studies, which includes only healthy people, not people with condition that were um, of interest. And a lot of it is cell culture data, uh, bench research. So not quite as far as the extent of those phase two, phase three trials that we talked about in terms of the FDA approval process. Um, and so individually as ingredients, there's that lack of data. And then when you put them together, there may be even more lack of data because we don't know how they all interact together. So when we're using combination product, I look at the individual ingredients itself and then think about it as a whole in terms of combined or um, additive, F, additive effect. Um, and then what a patient, particular patient is actually being prescribed and taking at the same time and kind of think of what that picture would look like in terms of added side effects, added effects on the organs, meaning the kidneys and the liver. And if anything interferes potentially with the medications, even in theory, there may be not a lack of data in looking at particularly say trikafta versus in combination with say um, piperine or curcumin. There is not gonna be a study out there that has a direct looking at those two together in the human body and seeing what the effects are, but looking at the pharmacology of it and in theory, extrapolating that knowledge to know, well, if it undergoes 3A4, it could interact, for example. Um, so combination products, again, need further research as well. Um, they have lots of different ingredients. So taking the time to look at them is very important. For example, some ingredients uh, may interact with things like antibiotics that a patient may be taking, or if they are post-transplant, any of their transplant medications as well. Um, or it could have effects on QT, uh, heart rhythm, if a patient is also on other medications such as azithromycin, 
that's a consideration because azithromycin, we have a concern of QTC in general, um, universally, not just in CF, in combination with other substances or medications that affect QT. Um, so again, looking at individual products and making sure that we're mindful of those things. Cannabis um, and cannabidiol or CBD is a very increasing trend and growing interest um, in chronic disease management and not just in cystic fibrosis. In 2020, about 18% of people age 12 and older reported using cannabis in some capacity in the last 12 months. And CBD and cannabis products have become very popular. You can find them in oil capacity and oil formulations, coffee. Um, even one of my students in residence found websites where you can find it in coffee products, edibles such as candy, gummies, pastries, et cetera. Um, and the proposed use in cystic fibrosis in terms of their effects can include appetite stimulation, GI effects, including being anti-emetic or anti-diarrheal properties, anti-inflammatory properties, and um, analgesia in terms of pain management. Um, it is important to note that cannabis is a compound in itself and it has chemical compound compounds within it, um, as well as CBD cannabidiol. Um, and that cannabinoids in general are involved with cytochrome P450. So they are processed through the liver to some capacity and have been known to be processed by 3A4 and 2C19, which are often a lot of medications that we use in CF and in chronic disease management. But we don't know quite yet what the clinical clinical relevance of that interaction is. We don't know what the extent of that interaction is. We just know that, that it's possible. Um, and so in the spring of 2020, um, uh, 2029 or 2019, 2020, we completed a survey looking at and asking the CF community, um, have you considered using cannabis products? And that can include, you know, um, cannabis itself, um, cannabidiol, hemp, um, just the big broad category of products. And almost 50% of adults with CF responded, yes, I have used it in some capacity. And almost 30% said they have actually considered using it. So we do need to be mindful of what the products are and what implications they have clinically on our patients as clinicians and partner with our patients to be able to come up with a safe monitoring plan if things are being used accordingly. Um, and the types of products that are being used are reported here. So cannabis, um, in terms of like inhalation or consumption, about 47% or so um, were used. And uh, CBD was a good portion as well. So those were the top two. Spice, K2, and synthetic cannabis were listed here. Those are things that you would find that are illicit, more of illicit um, uh, substances. But we listed them here because it is under that same category of synthetic cannabis or cannabis type product. Hemp was a little bit less often used as you can see here. In terms of the fashion in which cannabis was reused or cannabidiol, majority was used or consumed orally. So as an edible product or even put it topically on the skin like CBD oil. Um, lesser percent so with vaping or smoking, although there is still some there a little bit less than 10% being used as vape or smoking. Um, and when asked of those who vape, or inhale cannabis or cannabidiol oil or um, other such substances, we asked why. Why inhale it versus consume it by mouth or putting it on your skin? Um, over a about a quarter of folks said that it works better for them. Um, there's also, it's easier to get um, and cost as well. Uh, patients have reported to me that finding that inhalation of products like cannabis, it is cheaper to inhale it than to consume it by mouth or orally in those products. So there is that consideration as well for our, our patients and families. And they truly believe that there is a health benefit uh, from products that have cannabidiol um, uh, component to it. And those that responded to the survey, um, just to kind of paint the picture of demographics, um, over 80% uh, of persons with CF that had their caregiver report their data and about 50% had lung functions greater than 70%. So these are relatively healthy individuals with pretty decent lung function um, who are exploring cannabis or cannabidiol products as part of their overall care and, and, and therapy. Um, given all of this data that we're talking about regarding CAM, the different products that are on the market, 
there was a previous stigma and there may be still existing a still stigma among CF clinicians about asking about it and that preconceived judgment. Um, and so our study team wanted to know how often do CF care teams ask about things such as cannabis? How often is it screened? How's it openly discussed as part of a CF care visit? And when we asked the CF community, meaning um, adults with CF and caregivers or persons with CF, we found that over 60% of people said that they have never had that discussion with their CF care team, that it has not been brought up or they weren't asked about it, um, which is very shocking. Um, whereas, you know, we asked them, well, if they were to ask about it, if your care team were to bring it up, how comfortable would you be to discuss it with your care team? And majority, a good portion of folks, 34 and 18% felt that they were either extremely comfortable or comfortable talking about, it. they just needed someone to bring it up. So again, having that two-way discussion and communication with your CF care team is really important. So us as clinicians, it's important to discuss and have an open forum, but also for, our, for our, us to make sure that our patients and families feel comfortable having that discussion with us. And so when we looked at the CF care team perspective, um, a group of us as clinical pharmacists and the social workers, we decided to survey CF clinicians on their perspective about cannabis and cannabidiol um, in this paper that you can find in pediatric pulmonology. Um, we asked, how often do you actually ask about cannabis as part of a CF care visit? And 48% said sometimes, 15% said they always ask. So still, we're not consistent with asking or having it as part of our routine uh, conversation of part of visits. And that only about 50 to 60% actually document what they find in the medical record. So then that having that gap of communication between providers and other care teams about if things are being used. Um, or being reported to be used. And when asked of clinicians, only about 25% of the clinicians that responded to our survey felt that they were extremely or very prepared to answer questions of their patients and families regarding cannabis and CF. And when it was specific to cannabidiol products, only 6% of people were actually comfortable talking about it, meaning that they felt like they didn't have that fulfilled knowledge and be able to be able to speak to it completely. So the lack of discussion may be through the lack of comfort of talking about it and not having enough data behind it. We also asked those clinicians, you know, what indications would you feel comfortable or you consider advocating for in terms of use of cannabis or cannabidiol for treatment as part of CF? And um, most folks felt like things for analgesia, appetite, as well as for depression, anxiety, and maybe something to consider, um, especially those regarding with cannabis um, and then more so with, or with cannabis or CBD. Um, a lot of the inhibition or lack of support for use of cannabis or cannabidiol even amongst these clinicians that participated in the survey was the concern about law and their specific laws, uh, federal versus state law. And so making sure that maybe your CF care team is aware of the current laws um, available in your state. So if we were to consider cannabidiol products or cannabinoid products, we know that they are found via oral consumption, um, inhaled and topical. Some possible adverse effects include hypotension, tachycardia even, dry mouth, um, GI effects such as constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain, but it can also elevate liver enzymes and transaminases, which are things that we monitor when patients are on a CF care modulator. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, it can cause liver injury in some cases, depending on the formulation and the amount. Um, and then there are possible drug, drug interactions, as we talked about before, with various uh, ISA enzymes, such as 3A4, that are part of uh, metabolism of cannabidiol products. Um, in 2020, there was an in vitro study looking at uh, macrophages of both healthy donors and those who have CF. And uh, the effects of... Um, Lenabasum, which is a cannabinoid receptor type 2 agonist on these macrophages. And what they found was that um, the, the compound modulated macrophage polarization in a way that would reduce inflammation in vivo, potentially. Um, and that they found that it decreased interleukin-13 and enhanced um, endocytic function. And then in 2021, there was a study looking at a phase 2 double-blind randomized placebo-controlled study um, in adults with CF with the same compound. And it was a 16 week trial where they did increasing doses over the 16 weeks. So starting out at one or five milligrams once a day and then going 20 milligrams once a day or twice a day and then follow up at week 16. 
The main priority of the study was to look at safety and tolerability of the compound, and then secondary outcomes included efficacy, which included changes in lung function or percent predicted FEV1, um, CFQR in terms of uh, quality of life markers, as well as biomarkers. Um, most of the adverse events reported in this trial were mild to moderate in nature, but they didn't find any difference in exacerbation rate, um, nor any change in percent predicted FEV1. They did find some reduction in some of the biomarkers, um, but not all universally. And so there still leaves that question of where's the role of uh, this particular compound or cannabinoid products in general. So I think there still needs to be further research to really further understand the mechanism, how it works, what dose would be needed, what formulation would be needed, et cetera. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of things out there um, in terms of different data available, different products, um, and definitely not enough time in this presentation to cover everything. Um, so as far as the case study, we'll go over some examples here. Um, so let's say you have an 18 year old female who comes to your clinic and has elevated liver enzymes. They previously expressed concern and questions about uh, complementary therapies, but hadn't reported using them. Um, best practices in terms of use. We're gonna go over some things here, talking about it, assessing the data, co-producing a plan, communicating both interprofessionally and collaborating, and then reporting adverse events. So as far as the case example, how would you present this conversation? How would you even start the conversation? Again, as you saw from the data previously, we don't talk about it enough as CF clinicians, and we probably should. Um, we feel that we do, but our patients and families per this last survey that we did in 2019, they felt that we didn't. So there's a disconnect in terms of how much clinicians think that they're asking about it and how much patients and families feel it's being discussed. So again, having that be a little bit more aligned. The sources of information of CAM can vary in terms of what's reported. Patients and families are getting information from various places, from social media to books and magazines to friends and family, other people with CF, um, but only about 7% report that they hear about it from their own care team, which is interesting. Um, first and foremost, I want to make sure that we have a no judgment zone. As CF clinicians, I want to make sure my patients and families know that whatever they report to me and they tell me is not going to make, I'm not here to make them feel bad, inadequate, or that they've done anything wrong. I want to make sure they know that that this partnership, it's a two-way street, and then I want to make sure that we're being as safe as possible. Um, and so I use more of a universal screening approach, and I don't just ask based on suspicion of use. So I ask across the board, any herbal supplements, additional dietary supplements that we're using, in addition, as we're talking about medication history. And if you're starting to add this conversation as part of your workflow at your clinic, think about it using it as a quality improvement initiative. Think about who's going to be asking the questions, how it'll be documented, how that information is going to be used. And make sure you collaborate with your patient advisory board patient family advisory board or council about how to best integrate that practice as part of CF care visits. Um, and so with this case study, uh, the patient family re reported using a mushroom liver cleanse um, and found based on the clinical pharmacist assessment that it was less likely that any medications on the current medication list would have attributed to the liver enzyme elevation and it might have been this additional supplement. And so it was agreed upon that they would discontinue the liver cleanse and re assess liver enzymes down the road to restart or to start the um, triple therapy modulator. Um, so where would you look for information? That's always a challenge for clinicians. Um, there are databases out there such as natural medicines database, which is available. Um, primary literature is always very helpful for friendly clinical pharmacists if you happen to have one. Um, and looking again at each individual ingredient and looking at the things that we talked about today in terms of the approach. Um, Think about how is it taken? How much is taken? What is considered a toxic dose? What are the possible effects? Does it affect the kidney or liver? Does it go under metabolism? Um, and there, are there any necessary changes to avoid harmful drug interactions? Um, and how should it be monitored? What sort of labs would you want to monitor and how often would you want to monitor it? So in partnering with patient family, you guys decide to um, know when they can start their triple therapy. So monitoring liver enzymes and then follow up once we're at a safe level to start that triple modulator therapy. And they would like to know if complementary therapies can be used in the future. So again, having that discussion and open conversation about it is important so that you can come up with a plan together. Um, think about, is the supplement safe? Communicating that, you know, in terms of it's not gonna necessarily treat or diagnose, 
um, but it may be helpful for promoting, if anything, um, and being cautious of any claims that are too good to be true, they probably are. And natural doesn't always mean safe. Again, no judgment zone, partnering with your families. Um, and if a supplement is decided to be used, to come up with a very reasonable monitoring plan. So checking labs once a month and then reassessing the effects, both positive and potential side effects of the product. And then documenting things very clearly in the medical records so that everyone's on the same page with follow-up. Um, communication is key. So following up on things, if you talked about one visit, follow up on your next visit. Um, making sure to screen for any side effects, changes in symptoms, um, and always referring, reviewing medications, current medications and current supplements. Changes can happen at any time between visits, so it's always good to re-ask. And again, co-producing that care plan. Um, documentation, both in the medical record and the medication list, that can be done in your medical record pretty easily in most cases, um, as well as the care plan in your clinic notes as well, so that folks, folks are aware of what's being monitored. All right, so um, when you co-produced your plan, for example, for this case scenario, the patient and family try agreeing, um, trying to supplement for immune health, let's say, and it has a bunch of different essential oils, no grapefruit, of course, because we're on a modulator. Um, but in co-producing the plan, the labs look okay, but then your patient reports they have constant headache and they notice that it's around the time when they take the supplement. So how do you report any adverse events? These are some important websites to keep in mind. You can always just Google FDA adverse event supplement and these websites will pop up. But there are actual portals that you can log into to submit reports of specific products so that the FDA is aware of any sort of side effects, um, harmful injury, things like that that are potentially being caused due to products or any sort of adulterated products. And I'm providing some additional resources here for you guys. Um, and then, of course, if you are lucky enough to have a, a clinical pharmacist as part of your CF care team, they're also a great resource. Um, I want to thank you guys for your time. And I uh, want to thank the committee and all persons with CF and their families for their willingness to work with me. Thank you so much. Dr. Fan, thank you so very much. That was incredibly helpful. And if you could stop sharing your screen just for a moment, that would be great there, just so we can all see you up close and personal. <laughs> I know everybody is wishing, dreaming that they had a Dr. Hannafan at their CF center <laughs> to discuss this with. And sadly, we are over time. The next presentation starts soon. So um, people will you know, we have a very, very long list of questions for you. So I have two questions. The sure. first one would be, would you be willing to meet with me post-conference, I don't mean this weekend, I mean in the near future, and do a mini podcast where we run through all these questions and, and sure. provide a follow-up Q&A with him? Yeah, absolutely. As there are so many great questions here. Yeah, so I tried to, I know I squeezed a lot of information in a short period oh, of time, but so I know people wanted to know about supplements and different data. So I was like trying to- Everything you said, spot on. At Stanford, I was on the parent advisory committee there and they were stunned when we did a survey. There were like 40 supplements people listed. They were taking then they had no idea so the only the second question on that final slide did it have a place for people to look up ingredients and you know make assessments of things they might be taking so um, the natural medicines database is a is a resource that um, is available through health institutions so clinicians may have access but patients and families may not so if you're a CF care team member and you can check your institution's library look up natural medicines database if your institution has a license for it, it's a great resource for on the spot sort of questions and just try to look at, because it'll organize things by adverse event, um, side effects, organ systems affected, potential drug direction. So it's a very nice, concise resource. Not every place has that license, unfortunately. Yeah. And um, you know, most of the people attending here are adults with CF and also family members. So I'm sure everybody's anxious now to look yes. up. Yes, the CF care team is also... Yeah, so the CF care teams, if you, you ask them, they should have access to a resource from the CF Foundation. There is a handout on herbal products and, and supplement products that were developed by the Education Committee. I was actually part of that. And it's a handout. It's not all-inclusive handout, but it has a lot of the more common products out there and the current data and recommendations regarding them. Great. And so everybody who's here, I know that this is like the more we now know, the more we have questions about it. <laughs> so I am really grateful to you, one, for being here today and sharing your time and your expertise. This is such important information. And I want to assure everybody else that we will be in the very near future having a follow up um, 
interview Q&A session that we will release as a podcast and we'll blast it on social media and on our e-newsletter. So I also thank you in advance for that, Dr. Fenn. Absolutely. Happy to provide any sort of additional information, um, share knowledge. And I also learn a lot from our patients and families. So it's a two-way street, as I've always said. Well, this is the beginning of a conversation. So thank you very much. And to everybody else, we'll all hop out of this room and see each other in about five minutes for the, I believe next is CF and bone health. So thank you everybody for being here. And Dr. Fan, thank you so very much. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye.